So thank you everybody. First of all, uh, it's uh, my honor to be here. Thanks to Dr. Ben Palahil and uh, Ben Kirkwood for uh, inviting me here and all the organizing team for this uh, great uh, hospitality in these days. And thank you guys for what we are showing in the pool and around the pool. So let's start this work. This work will be on autonomous <coughs> robotic networks for underwater surveillance. And let's start about why we should uh, investigate the oceans. The oceans, as you may know, are more than 70, cover more than 70% of Earth's surface, and the more than 80% of the oceans is still unmapped, unobserved, and unexplored. As someone said, we know more about the surface of the Moon and about Mars than about uh, the sea floor and the, the, the deep sea floor. This is true, but the question that uh, comes next is why we should investigate the, the sea, for many reasons. First of all, biodiversity. More than 90% of biosphere is in the water. All the life that we know is in the water. And uh, oceans are full of resources. So let's come more to, to business side. More than 35% of oil is extracted by uh, oceans. And also gas is uh, something like 28% that is increasing. The percentage will increase in the next years. Trade is mainly conducted by sea. More than 80% of trade is conducted by sea. And finally, for surveillance, security, and search and rescue response after disaster that unfortunately happens uh, often. So, uh, how do we observe the sea? Traditional, the observation of the sea is uh, made uh, with uh, ships. The ships are very useful, but are expensive and uh, can give spatial information. Fixed buoys, you can put the buoys, they give uh, you know, they give uh, some temporal information, but about uh, one point. And uh, more recently, uh, with the remote sensing from space, you can measure something, many things, but not uh, all that you are interested in. So, with the uh, recent uh, advances that we have in electronics and robotics, we passed from this uh, concept to other kinds of concepts, the use of drifters, that are objects that you leave, and they move uh, uh, with the currents. And the next step is the use or robots, or UMS, unmanned maritime systems. So why using a robot, a robotic system? For many reasons. First of all, they increase the spatial and temporary solution of the monitoring. What it means? It means that you can have a system that can measure an area in a more uh, thicker way with respect to a ship, and above all, with a more temporary solution. That is, you cannot leave a ship in an area, in a restricted area for many time, for much, many much time, because uh, it costs a lot. So they can offer what we call persistent monitoring that's really important uh, in what we do and uh, what oceanographers uh, do. And they are very cheap compared to traditional means. Just to give you an idea, one ship day of a, a medium ocean, oceanographic ship is about 50,000 uh, 50, euros uh, per day. So they can be autonomy. You can see, you can see something later about this later. And uh, we can have different types of robots with different features. That is, we can have specialists for many uh, missions, and they can work together in a network to provide what we call uh, synoptic measurements. Synoptic is an important word for the oceanography. It means that you have, uh, at the same time, measurement from different places. And this is important when you want to uh, produce model or you want to what, what they call uh, data simulation, to, what, to inject new measurement in their model to improve them and then there is a, a so-called a cycle in which the model can drive the robot's operation. So this is what we are doing at uh, the uh, where I work, that is the Center for Maritime Research Experimentation. It's in La Spezia here, that is uh, in Italy. It's a nature research center, and we conduct research in autonomous system, ocean science, modeling and simulation, acoustics, and other disciplines. Uh, we have two ships. This is the big one, the Alliance, and the small one, the Leonardo, and many kinds of robots. So uh, the outline of my, of my presentation will be this one. I will start talking about underwater surveillance and uh, anti-submarine warfare. This is what I'm, I'm working on. Our approach to uh, this uh, area, the importance of autonomy for MEUSS operations, and finally, how to explore, to give some idea, how to explore multiple nodes of the network to improve the overall mission performance. So what's underwater surveillance? For underwater surveillance, we, we say that we need to detect, localize, and classify some targets that may be very different, diverse manned or unmanned vehicles, in an underwater area of interest using a fixed or 
mobile heterogeneous sensors. From uh, the point of view of anti summary warfare, in trad traditionally, this is a very people intensive activity carried out by traditional means, essentially ships towing some uh, array of microphones in which they, you, you, can, uh, you can hear the sound uh, uh, of these uh, guys at sea. So the final objective is to, to infer from the large amount of collected data if a target is present in the area and to track it for its correct classification. What we envision at CMRE is the use of sensorized AUVs acting as autonomous mobile nodes in a multi-static network. The aim is to develop an autonomous system providing effective uh, performance at a fraction of the cost of traditional assets, while at the same time providing uh, the so-called persistent patrolling of an enemy. So, uh, here, just to give you an idea, we have, uh, uh, you have an acoustic source that can be uh, fixed or mobile, it emits, it emits a pink, you have reflection, so we have these two guys, there are our two robots, 4.5 meter long, with the towing and a, an array of microphones. You create uh, contacts that are these small uh, points, means uh, range and very measurement, and then you usually pass them uh, in a tracker. It means something that joins these uh, points together and creates the tracks that are uh, these, uh, these lines in the area of, uh, of interest. So, but there are many challenges to, to be faced. First of all, to have uh, effective signal processing on board the vehicles, because the vehicles, as you know, are not like the workstation that we have in our offices. So the, uh, the processing power is not at that time. So we have many transmitter waveforms, and above all, you, you, you can see here, these are the contacts of all one day. So uh, uh, in uh, all these contacts, you have to localize uh, something. And above all, the big challenge is classification. You have many tracks, and you have to decide which one may be of interest. Second, there are still hardware and software problems in uh, managing uh, these, uh, uh, these systems. For instance, launch and recovery, because uh, the sea usually is uh, rough. <laughs> endurance and robustness for at sea operations and use of common standards and finally something that uh, is a problem and uh, you, you guys know here better than, uh, than me communications communication is a big challenge and uh, since we use acoustics acoustics underwater propagates but not that well or at least not that uh, easily and uh, just to give you some example the range in our case uh, are uh, lower than uh, six, five kilometers and very low band, something like 60 bytes per, per second. That is, you don't have uh, Wi-Fi underwater. So our idea is to use a, a sort of a hybrid robotic networks. For hybrid, I mean that we have static nodes here that compose the network infrastructure and the mobile nodes, the robots, that build on that to optimize net network performance. The idea is to integrate this kind of network in traditional main systems and the C2 means the command and control systems. So the network concept offers scalability, redundancy, robustness, and persistency, the possibility of uh, data sharing, data fusion, that is really important when you have sensors that are not that capable, but putting together, they can reach performance as uh, ships, the opportunity to complement existing assets, and finally, the importance of autonomy and cooperation. Here, what we usually deploy in our experiments, here you have uh, uh, the source, usually a buoy or towed by the ship, here you have a uh, uh, wave uh, glider that are surface vehicle and uh, buoys that creates, uh, they have modems, so they create an uh, uh, underwater communication uh, network. Our two guys that uh, are called uh, Groucho and Arpo OEX AUVs. And finally the ship that usually tows this guy that is uh, called Eco Repeater, is a sort of artificial target. Uh, what all, all the data that you will see today comes from uh, this. Uh, this target is told by the ship and simulates a possible target. So, um, as we were seeing before, the importance of autonomy. Uh, you can see here a uh, famous uh, robot for the kitchen, I don't say uh, branding for not making advertisement, but uh, I can assure that it works. And we can say this uh, robot is automatic. What, what I mean for automatic? Automatic, I mean that uh, this is a pre planned uh, robot. And a liquid operator is always needed to improve the emission performance. On the other side, we have a smart robot, what we can call autonomous robot, because it's capable of making autonomous decisions on the basis of current situation or current data, 
Online planning and replanning uh, can work without a link with the operator. This is really important because uh, when you have a vehicle underwater, you cannot assure a reliable link with the robot. So the robot should know uh, what to do and to make autonomous decisions. How this translates at sea? Translate at sea that preplanned trajectories are a traditional way of uh, conducting this kind of experiment. You have uh, some uh, path, you recover the vehicle, and then you replan another another mission, and so on. On the other side, we had the, the so-called data-driven survey, in which the vehicle change their uh, movement, the heading, based on the data. So, if the preplanned missions are predictable, they offer a uniform coverage, so it's really good when you want to deploy something at sea and not to lose the vehicle in the water, but at a fixed resolution. While, on the other side, autonomy can give us uh, something more. So, autonomous decisions, active sensing paradigm, you can uh, change your signal processing chain based on uh, environmental condition and so on. And above all, data-driven surveys. That is, you can change something that uh, you can change the heading, you can change position, trying to increase the performance of the mission. So, it's good because you can improve your performance, but it does not offer uniform coverage. So, as always in life, you have to find a trade-off between uh, pre-planned missions and uh, data-driven missions. So, from an AUV perspective, uh, an area surveillance can be divided in different uh, uh, phases, the strategy. We have a first level in which you have exploration and patrolling of an area. When something interesting is found, you start moving to try to reduce these uh, cues that you have about possible targets, and at the end you select uh, some of them, in theory one, and you start to optimize your position of your network to increase uh, uh, some performance of the mission, for instance, tracking, tracking performance. This is how we, we have our system, autonomy system, uh, in, uh, on the vehicle. I don't enter into detail, but uh, uh, it's a three level detail. And uh, the main idea is to have uh, modularity, that is something that uh, you, you should. Uh, Always work on that because it's really important for testing and for being able to test your software before going at sea. And expandability because the ability, if you want to change something about your mission while you are going at sea, it should not be, uh, you know, uh, too hard. Sometimes it's, it's better, you know, to do something, some hacks, something that's like that. But at the end, it's uh, always better to try to think a little bit before to your code before before writing that. <laughs> So, uh, this is our state machine, how it works. We start with exploration, and uh, the robot you can see here a sort of behavior. We have uh, two vehicles, the simulation data, and these are the um, um, acoustic model giving the probability of detection. They will try, this is a particle filter running, this is, this is the target. They will try to keep the target in a high uh, uh, probability of detection area. It's a sort of uh, our exploration of, um, of the, you can see here, in cooperative way. When something is, uh, is, uh, is found, what does it mean? It means that uh, you have all these tracks coming, and you have uh, an online classifier that from the initiated track, at a certain point, it says that the track is confirmed. It means it's interesting. But the, the track can disappear, so it becomes uncertain. So you try to reacquire the target, and if this happens, it means uh, you find new tracks that uh, are in some way compatible with an observed one, it becomes reacquired. This drives other kind of, uh, of, of behavior, for instance, this one, the non myopic receiving horizon track optimizer, that works a little bit in this way. You have uh, a track, so a possible position of the target, you have uh, your receiver, you start to create a decision tree, and then you evaluate uh, all these uh, pos pos possibilities, trying to keep the, um, the path that optimizes uh, the tracking performance. And then you get the first decision and then you pass that to the robot autopilot. At every decision step, you do again your calculation. And why this is important? You can see here some data. That is, here is the true um, experiment at sea. The robot, this is the robot with the, this is, uh, I don't know if you see that, the green is the array. And uh, this is uh, the target, this is the Leonardo to win the repeater. This is the track. And this is a, a sort of, uh, this is a simulated uh, race track. It means that uh, that was the race track that the robot was doing before starting to make autonomous decision. So uh, what uh, I did to, to see if uh, the, the movement was, uh, was uh, smart, let's say, is to prosecute this, uh, um, this uh, direction and to try 
to put the error in uh, localization in the two cases. The, the black one is with the uh, data-driven survey and the magenta one with uh, the race track. So at the beginning, the error increases because usually when the vehicle turns, the array bends. So uh, the beamforming, that is some signal processing, uh, signal processing algorithm, uh, deteriorates the performance. But after a while, you see how much is better to uh, change this. Why? Because uh, in a normal, in an, an array, uh, the best performance is where you, you are at the so-called broadside. It means if you have this is the array you see in this way, and uh, when you get closer. So this is or uh, the trade-off that uh, tries to uh, to achieve with this algorithm. You see, it goes closer. At the same time, it keeps the vehicle at broadside. In the other case, it would go towards end fire. End fire means to the front and to the back of the vehicle where the array and the linear array do not work well. So uh, this is what autonomy can do in uh, this kind of particular applications, but uh, we can also, in this uh, limited environment uh, in, uh, scenario, we can also exploit the different modes that we, we may have at sea. Why? Because if changing tracks and contacts can improve uh, the, um, the signal processing performance, share information is needed to create uh, the so-called common picture of the scene, that is, uh, the robot has to know a little bit about uh, the other vehicles to make uh, cooperative uh, decision. And finally, using communication can provide services to the network. For instance, when you are in deep water, it's not easy to, have, to know where the robots are, so the network can uh, exchange data to improve this uh, navigation. Data fusion, uh, you can see here different tracks, and here is the fused tracks. You see how all these false tracks are, are uh, removed. And uh, it's another important thing is task allocation. Very briefly, when you have a, a team of, uh, of uh, robots and uh, some tasks that they have to do, for instance, uh, uh, investigating a track, exploring an area, you, uh, working as communication uh, uh, relay, they have to decide uh, which one has to be allocated to a certain task. So usually we use this uh, so-called task utility, that is uh, uh, reward minus cost, and uh, we have used uh, this uh, market-based allocation in, uh, in a more general way. There is uh, someone that is called uh, uh, auctioneer that asks the other task, the other, um, the other um, vehicles, uh, to, uh, to bid for a possible task, they bid, and the action here awards uh, the best uh, bidder uh, with, uh, with that task. But uh, it's really hard to, to bring these in at sea because communication, as, uh, as I've seen before, as I said before, is not reliable. So the idea is to have uh, a sort of distributed mark based uh, algorithm, completely distributed, in which there is no distinction between bidders uh, and auctioneers. You can see here. Some example of simulation, here are three robots, here are two paths that they can follow. This one is related to this, these are the cumulative probability of detection on the area. And you see how they, as changing data, they can uh, be allocated to one area or to another. Here is uh, the task change and here is uh, the general index of the group. And you see how the, the, um, the allocation is done to reduce, this, this uh, function that has to minimize is uh, to, reduce, uh, to reduce that. And finally, one of the tasks, uh, the cooperative task that we have uh, tested at C is this one, is uh, the cooperative track execution. Usually you have uh, a robot. He calls another, another uh, robot to, to help him and uh, sends a track. This, uh, this guy does not uh, know this track, so he starts to move, to maneuver, right, to maneuver, to, uh, as uh, if he knew the track, that is, he propagates uh, this uh, track into the future and tries to optimize it using the other algorithm. At a certain point, hopefully, a track is created by the second vehicle that sends the first one for a track-to-track -track fusion. That if you put these two tracks together, at that, this point, robot A can confirm that what we have seen, it has seen something. So, that's something really interesting, and uh, I will show you some uh, one video. Uh, in the video, you, you would see blue tracks that are the so-called initiated. Red tracks are the confirmed, that is, the online classification decide that they are useful to be investigated more. The magenta tracks are the one unobserved. Dark colors, so is uh, this one, uh, Groucho, the, the, the 
dark green, RX is for the position of the vehicles, light green is for the hard pole, the hard ladder robot, the orange is the target position, and this green little star are real-time track-to-track association because the vehicles exchange tracks and they can fuse them to increase the scoring and to support the classification process. So here are the, some experiments done uh, in front of Piombino in uh, October in Italy. And you can see here the, the, the trajectory of the, of the target with the, the, with the tracks. And here you can see the autonomous behavior of the vehicles. They are calling each other. At a certain point, uh, here you will see a nice man maneuver. They are calling each other, and in this way, they are they are starting to turn to north east. The certain point to keep the target as before at the broadside, and at the same time getting closer to to the target, improving the tracking performance. That it means to have longer tracks to support the clarity final classification. So to conclude, this system offers many advantages for underwater surveillance. It is envisaged a strong increase on these systems in the future. These advantages have been accepted in the mine countermeasure missions, less in the ESW because the environment is more complex, large areas and limited communications. Autonomy and effective use of network and multiple robotic nodes are crucial to improve the performance of these vehicles. Above all, in the limited communication environment, that is the real challenge of this kind of, uh, of uh, applications. So, uh, we need improvements in collaborative intelligence and signal processing. New ideas are coming and will come from the development of AI, big data, and machine learning. Ocean engineering challenges remain uh, to be solved, in particular standards. At CMRE, we have, um, we have worked on this uh, Genus standard for uh, digital communication, that uh, it should be one of the, of the many standards that should follow to to facilitate interoperability and the use of different uh, systems. And above all, it also it's time, if you want to really use this system uh, and see, to talk about liability, classification, standardization, and safety and security. Because this is important before you want uh, to sell your own uh, UV or your own surface vehicle, and the people can use that without uh, you know, being arrested. And finally, for a well-defined liability regulation, it's important the transparency of autonomous system. That uh, I don't know because it's uh, there is uh, some study ongoing, but I think it's really important to to arrive uh, to know if something happens, who is uh, who has to be blamed for. So it is time to move uh, from the labs and the restricted area for operations in the world of or the world. world. It, it's uh, your job in the next future, guys. So I would like to conclude with some advertisements. So uh, as uh, Ari was saying before, we are we are organizing some competition. The competition was in front of a power plant, and we had the land, sea, and air robot. Uh, the, the tower simulated the, the room of control of the power plant, so the robot had to enter there and to close some uh, box. And the Marvin robot should tell the other one which one to close, and vice versa to force cooperation between the domains.
Thank you.